Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we disrupt an industry, the future, everything. Today we've got somebody who's trying to do that in an unconventional but important way. John Doran's on the program. He's a school psychologist and he's focused, he's a teacher, he's he's a lot of things. And that's why we re-record these intros because they're nearly impossible to do well. So John, welcome to the program. It's a great honor and delight to join you, Matt, this morning. So we were talking a little bit before we got started about education and the issues that kids are facing. So can you give me a quick 30,000 foot view of who is John Doran and then we'll jump into that. Well, John Doran is an educator first and foremostly, Matt. I've been teaching and now guidance counselor for 25 years in a school. And my passion is helping young people do all that they can with all that they have in the space that they're in with the time that they've got. Uh, and really my passion is making education real and relevant in a world where the pace of change in the future will never be slower than it is today. And that's bringing its own challenges for young people. And that unifies young people right across the world, how to make the most of what they have. And they're all forced into an education system, which, as you kind of alluded to, is, is a bit slow behind. Well, you know what, Matt, I, I, as my career has gone on, and I wrote a book called Ways to Wellbeing, about eight years ago, I started saying that we were doing a disservice to our young people by only concentrating on their left brains. And I was talking about emotional intelligence, that, you know, in, their integrity was going to be as important as their income, that we had to help them learn how to learn, unlearn and relearn. So it's about relationships, Matt. And the most the more important relationship young people, indeed ourselves, will ever have is the one we have with ourselves. So I like to talk about education in terms of relationships, because most AI is going to decimate most of the orthodox jobs that are there. So for young people to thrive and survive in the world to come, they're going to have to work on their emotional intelligence quotient. How do you do that in a school setting that's designed to put out factory workers? Really good point, Matt. And I think um, you could make a case that we're educating young people for a world that doesn't exist in a system perfectly designed for a world that's no longer there. How do you do that? I think there's a number of things that I've seen that can help. I think we need to strategically teach strategic optimism, entertaining the possibility that things can work out. I think we also have to teach young people stress management. We also have to teach things like Professor Angela Lee Duckworth's idea of grit, Professor Carl Dweck's concept of growth mindset, the neuroplasticity of the brain, the fact that we're learning, unlearning and relearning into old age. I have a friend, Matt, Joe Vasilev, who's 102 and is in Trinity College studying history. That's the new dispensation. We, we now know that the brain can learn with an incredible capacity. So I think that's a sign of great hope for young people. But education really has to catch up with where young people are at to do them a service. And you are right. It's an outdated factory model. We need a more organic uh, mentality of education about going, growing them from the roots up. Can you teach grit and optimism, though? I, I would be skeptical. I think you can, Matt. I suppose I'm a natural optimist. I think it's about the idea that, you know, you, you can entertain the possibility that things will work out, that things, sometimes we have black and white thinking. And for a young person, say 16 or 17, and they lose a first love, they don't think they'll ever meet anybody again, chapter closed. Mm -hmm. But it's entertaining the possibility that things are always in transition. We're in transition. Mm -hmm. We're growing. My favorite definition of education, Matt, is that it's a conversation between one generation and another about what's really important in life. Now, that's a shared conversation that everyone is our teacher. And that actually is quite often, even this morning, a young person taught me a great lesson about relationships. He said to me, sir, how are you today? And we sometimes underestimate the small things. How are you? But I think we can teach up a strategic, I call it strategic optimism, Matt. I'm not talking about a Pollyanna, things will always work out well. But I think strategic optimism is saying, what can I learn from this that can make me better the next time I face it? That's being optimist. That, that's tuning in your inner coach rather than being a slave to your inner critic. You know, what I say we have an internal radio station, Me FM, playing 24 hours a day. And quite often, it's very, very negative. It is. And I think that's, a, that's part of the reason that I wanted to get you on, because this is something, the world's getting healthier, we're living longer, and yet shit, something like 20% of America is on SSRIs. Yeah. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of ludicrous to see the, the dichotomy that's happening. And why do you think that is? 
I, the Professor Martin Selman talks about a concept called learn, learned helplessness, where a person almost feels a slave to their thoughts. And that's where I think strategic optimism comes in. You know, the greatest weapon you have against stress, Matt, is the capacity to choose one thought over another. And that starts off with the awareness that you have that power. And that's very empowering. It, it connects you to your resilience. It actually, de, I suppose, decouples you from the sense of being overwhelmed and, 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 and overpowered and, and, and anxious. The capacity that we have to change our thoughts. We mightn't be able to choose the first thought that comes into your head, but you can certainly choose whether you, t- you attach to it or not. So this learned helplessness, I see more and more presenting in my office, and I suspect on your side of the pond as well. Definitely. What do you think about a lot of these mindfulness and meditation apps and neural feedback devices we've been seeing pop up? Well, I, I like to keep it simple, Matt. Uh, I, I, I'm from a simple farming background myself, so I keep it organic. And all mindfulness is, if you strip away all connotations away from it, it's just non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. To be where your feet at, to get out of your head and get into your life. And I think sometimes, you know, we take 20,000 breaths a day. How many did you or I take consciously this morning? I suspect very, very little. So I tell people, just get into your body, get into your breath. Your, the secret to your well-being is right underneath your nose. It's in your breath. And the more we can tap into that, Matt, the more we can tap into our body, I think the better our mental wealth and our mental health. I think I would agree, but I think for a lot of people, this sounds woo-woo. And for anyone that's in school, the percentage is just much, much higher in terms of how many listening to this think we're absolutely nuts having this conversation. So make a, Matt, make, make a compelling case. I will. Matt, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the ground. My boots are in the trenches, in the classrooms. And you'd be pleasantly surprised how many people have taken to this. For example, when I say to young people that this is taught by the Navy SEALs, situational awareness, this is an inbuilt part of their program. Most kids who follow sports, sports psychology, mindfulness is all part of it. People are buying into it, Matt, in a way that they never did before. I think it's becoming less of a kind of a woo-woo, kind of an airy-fairy concept, because I'm a very practical guy. I like things that make my life better. And to actually get out of trapped in my thoughts and get into my body is a necessity, Pat. Uh, Matt, it's not a luxury anymore. And I think uh, you'd be amazed at how many young people are. I'm not talking about meditating on a Himalayan mountain for an hour. I'm talking about 60 seconds time out just to check in with yourself. As they say over here, Matt, check yourself before you wreck yourself. I always loved that quote. It's a great one. It's a great one. How did you get into all this? What was the what was the motivation? About eight years ago, Matt, I was wondering were we doing a service to our young people? And I was talking to some people, senior executives in Facebook and, and people in banking, and they were telling me they had a huge in- problem with their intake of graduates. High flyers, high achievers, but couldn't form any relationships with anybody. Couldn't create trust within the organization. And they kept on telling me about emotion and intelligence, the awareness of your own weather, your ability to regulate it. And crucially, Matt, something that this generation is losing, the ability to empathize with others. So I said, if we're going to make young people employable, we have to connect them to emotion and intelligence. And about eight years ago, I was talking to a number of people in sports and sports psychology. And I felt this was the missing piece that, you know, we had to actually consciously put up you know, emotional intelligence, happiness, our well-being. A happy student performs better. A happy student's ability to solve a maths problem math was up by 27%. If I'm not happy and I'm well-adjusted as a teacher, as a person, my concentration levels in the classroom are going to go down to zero. So this is something that's really important. I mean, no one lives, no one lives a stress-free life, Matt. And I, I, know, I don't like to distress because stress is important. But when stress becomes distress, learning goes out the window. So it's become my passion over the last eight years. And I do have a bit of an issue about the word well-being, Matt. Certainly this side of the water is becoming a cliche and, uh, and it's becoming too much in common currency. I like to talk in terms of relationships. The quality of relationships in our life will determine our well-being. It's ironic that you were talking to Facebook about that. What has social media done? Well, I think, Matt, potentially social media is the new smoking in terms of we won't know the damage. I mean, there was a time in the 50s when people told you smoking was good for your health. Nine out of 10 doctors recommend Marlboro. Yeah, so I I do suspect that, and I don't want, again, to diss social media. There's elements of it that are fantastic, but 
I say in my TED talk, Matt, we, we have a paradox. We've never been, this is the most connected generation in the history of the world, and yet paradoxically never more disconnected. So, you know, there's something going on with social media and it's desensitizing a generation to the actual feelings of other people, keyboard warriors. So there is a real issue. And I think people are starting to push back on unfettered use of social media. You know, the effect it's having on our brains. Um, it is a real concern and a growing concern, Matt. I don't have the answer to it, but certainly we need to keep our eyes on the radar. And uh, I'm not so sure we can leave the custodians of this in the hands of the social media giants. I think this is a conversation that parents, educators, young people, we need to be into this discussion. It's interesting because younger kids are on social media a lot. But if you looked at if you looked at who helped get Trump elected, it was primarily fake news shared by older uh, middle middle uh, middle income middle aged Americans because they are susceptible to oh, but this is real, right? What, people, why is there that weird divide? I think people tend to believe what they see and, and what they don't, you know, they, they tend to take it rather gullibly. But the interesting thing, Matt, is um, in the last year or two, more and more of my young people are presenting with loneliness. They're lonely. And that's the interesting dichotomy of having so many friends. I, I, so I'll say to a young person, my prescription for you is not Xanax or drug. My prescription for you is exercise and to meet a friend rather than add a friend. You know, as simple as that, get off your social platform and actually go over to somebody in real time and say three of the most cathartic, empowering words you possibly can. How are you? You know, there are three very small words. I did it myself this morning. And by saying, how are you to that young person? I was saying the Africans have a South Africa have a lovely phrase, Ubuntu, Matt, I see you. Too many people in our world are going around feeling invisible. And that has to stop, Matt. Too many people are disconnected. Uh, too many people are living their lives online. And I'm aware that we're using this tool. But it's not the tool per se, Matt. You can use a knife to eat your meal or you can use a knife to stab somebody. Social media is the same. We can use this platform as we are to try and empower and educate people. But it can also be used for wrong as well. So I think an, uh, education around the, the positives and the drawbacks of social media platforms are really important. We can't just trust that the benefits will be taken and that the negatives will be negated. We, we can't leave that to chance. The, the stakes are too high. They are too high, and yet the road to, road to hell is paved in good intentions. It kind of slips down the slope, so to speak. Yeah, I think the, I, I think the key word, Matt, is awareness. Uh, when, once you're aware, you know, and in fairness to platform providers like, like Apple, I, you know, the screen time to let somebody know, actually, just look at how many, much of your day has been devoted to your various apps, etc. That's very important, Matt, to kind of reclaim some of your time. I mean, the social devi devices are designed to be time hoovers. They're very carefully neuro programmed almost to take up so much of your time to be so immersive that you literally lose track of time. So to be aware of that, Matt, is really important. No, no, no much so than when we were aware of the harmful effects of nicotine. To be aware is the first step in the process of, of recovery, if you want to use that word. And the, the big problem is the business model. It's surveillance capitalism. When you have an advertising model, it's based off of eyeballs and attention. Do we have to, do we have to start moving towards banning that or in some way? Well, I think certainly that conversation has started happening with so, some of the social media giants on this side of the pond. You know, your Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. I think the conversation about social responsibility, Matt, is starting. And that's in everybody's interest, could I say. Also in terms of the providers, that's a conversation that involves everybody that is prejudicial to nobody and benefits all. I think that's starting. You could argue that it's not as fast pro, fast paced as we'd like it to be, but I certainly seen some growth of that conversation starting out of necessity, Matt. What's the future of education? Everyone has great ideas about things they would like to add, but they're never willing to say the classes or schedules they'd be willing to cut. Well, I, I would say less is more. Um, we have a fantastic coach here in Ireland, uh, Joe Schmidt. He's a rugby coach. And he was approached by Google. And uh, Google were looking to get him involved in a project, Aristotle, to find out the secret sauce, the algorithm of highly performing teams, of which Joe has one of the greatest in the world. And Joe said, I can save you a lot of money and define it in two words, feeling valued. 
I think less is more. Joe said that to us in a talk. Less is more. I think we should have a smaller curriculum, Matt, but actually focus more on young people feeling valued. Feeling valued, sense of social responsibility, emotional intelligence. Our curriculums are overloaded, Matt. Um, it's almost like we try to fill young people with a load of information and at a predetermined date, if they successfully regurgitate the information we put in their heads in the first place, they'll get a certain grade. I think education has moved on. I think young people have moved on. What's lacking is us. I think we have to have less on the curriculum, but more quality connections with the young people to find out what their interests are, where their world is, and what will serve them in that world that's being created as we speak here. So I give you a magic wand. What does that look like? I think that looks like informing, raising student voice, getting young people into talk about what are the subjects and passions that they have, speaking to them about what they want to do. And I really think strategically teaching emotional intelligence, the importance of relationship, teaching things like networking, like we're doing, we were talking before we came on, on air, Matt. You know, what are the skills? I think it has to be more skill-based. Skills like listening. You know, why aren't we teaching skills like listening? Why did I have to be in my 40s? before anybody told me that in a land of talkers like Ireland, the listener is the king. You know, these are skills that are hidden in plain sight, Matt, that I think we need to ramp up in our curriculum, that are skills that will serve our young people well. So to answer your question, less is more. Is the future of school in a school or is it something else entirely? That's a really good question. I think automation will take away a lot of things, Matt, but it actually won't take the necessity for a teacher. And I don't think that space will necessarily be a hologram. I think that physical connection, that, that need will always be there. A young, peop, a young person asked me, one of the, they asked me difficult questions all the, all the time, Matt. One of the hardest questions I was ever asked was by a 10-year-old. I said, sir, why do I need a teacher when I've got Google? And it was a really good question. Now, like a good teacher, I let the silence do the heavy lifting. And like is not, a young person will come to your aid. And Paul said... Uh, Lisa, Mr. Dorn doesn't teach us history. Mr. Dorn teaches us a love of history. Now, I reckon you'll find out everything in my head in Google, but it won't teach you enthusiasm. It won't teach you passion and it won't teach you a love of a subject. That's Mr. Dorn's job. And that's the teacher's job, Matt, to transmit an enthusiasm uh, and a passion for the subject that they're teaching. And I don't think you can replicate that uh, on a platform or in a hologram. That's that face time that young people need, that they're not just a brain. You're also a person. And I think better people make better everything. And I was taught that by, I mentioned the second best coach in the world, Matt, and I mentioned the first best in my TED Talk, Butter Colin O'Connell, who said better people make better everything, that you're teaching the person. And I think most schools talk about holistic education, Matt, but I think a lot of schools only pay it lip service. You know, we see that young person as a brain, but actually they're a person and we have to teach to the person not just the left side of the brain. So I think the, where education skates to, I'm not so sure. But I'm not so sure that the teacher will become redundant. I think that teacher will probably be needed even more. What will change will be the content. What do you think about the Montessori approach and some of these alternative approaches to education? Um, I'm not so sure, Matt, from the point of view. I, I, I didn't go to school until I was relatively late. I was aged five that I started. And my dad he would always say, I would time enough. And I think sometimes schools can actually, and Ken Robinson speaks to this, can almost sometimes suffocate the natural creativity, curiosity, and inquisitiveness of young people. So I'm not so sure that I believe in the kind of almost the Japanese model of get them when they're in the cradle and almost, you know, inculcate all of this material in. I sometimes think let a child be a child and let that natural curiosity, that innate goodness, that innate resilience come to the fore and try and shape and mold and model that uh, rather than try to see them as some kind of a joke to be filled up. You know, let, um, as WB Yates said, let's try and light fires rather than fill jokes. Do you think that schools kill creativity or let's play devil's advocate? Could it be society when kids see their parents working jobs that suck, that, that they hate having to do that day after day and to get a bigger house, to compete with the Joneses. Is it school that crushes creativity or is it humanity? I think it can be a little bit of both, Matt, but I think the, really the school model has to have its own share of culpability in the question. You know, rote learning, that factory model that you alluded to, that's still very much alive in the 21st century. 
how well does it service in a world that's changing so dramatically, in a world where the factories of 10, 15 years ago no longer exist? I would humbly suggest not so well. So that curiosity, that creativeness, that propensity we have to say, sit down, shut up and listen to me, that's gone. That's old hat, Matt. Now, that is changing, I'm glad to say. And I'm very optimistic about the future, not just about the wonderful profession of teaching and education, but about the future of young people in general. Um, but that old model that served us well for a world that no longer exists, I think we have to take the best of it and dump the rest and, and skate to where the world is going. Um, but there's other pressures that you say, Matt. I mean, the statistics of people who are happy in their work are very, very scary. Only 13% of people surveyed said they absolutely love what they do, that their blood sings at the thought of going into work on a Monday morning. 64% of people say, oh, I'll get up on Monday morning wishing it was Friday. And the other percentage absolutely hate what they do. So that's very scary statistics, Matt, about, you know, in the world of work, the people, only 13% of people say they love what they do. They, they have found their passion. They have found their mojo. So I say to young people, make sure that you are building yourself up and adding value to yourself so that you can be in that lucky few, that 13% of people that love doing what they're doing. You know, find your passion and you'll never be, you'll never be apologetic about it. Let's say automation does become something that starts to displace jobs. We won't argue whether or not it will. Let's say it does. What happens to society and well-being? Do, do we fall apart when people suddenly start to lose purpose? It's a very difficult question to answer, Matt, because we're going into the great unknown here. Um, and I don't know the, and, and my fear would be for, this, for, for the lower skill jobs that would be totally gone. What those people are going to do. So really, we are going to have to put a lot of store into learning, unlearning and relearning. The idea of being in the one job for the rest of your life is gone. You know, you're not going to be talking to any young person now about a job for life in any domain. You're going to be talking about a job for the life of a contract. You know, a young person could have 18, 90, 20 jobs. A young person aged five, by the time they're at school going or at employment age, 68% of the jobs available to them haven't been created yet. That's the world we're living in, Matt. Now, the, the consequences of that, I don't know. Anybody who tells you they do know, I think they're blowing smoke because no one can know. But the secret lies in education and retraining, and, and that's the, the, the answer, because those jobs will not be there. But there are issues, Matt, at a societal level, at a crime level, for a whole generation of young people whose jobs that hit or two they would have found meaning in are gone. Now, what do we do? That's a conversation that will have to involve everybody. Do you think it's more of a problem for young people, or it's more of a problem for people that are more established? So... Typically, typically what you'll find is the older you are, the less conservative you get, or the more conservative you get, the less willing you are to try new things, focus on education, etc. Do you think young people will be hit hardest or older and middle age? I, I, it may be a stereotype or a cliche to say that young people, by definition, are, are more versatile. They're more mobile. Um, older you get, the more static, perhaps. But it does raise a challenge for both young and old. And for a lot of the older people, Matt, it's quite scary. You know, I've only ever taught in one school all my life. I'm a dinosaur. I'm very aware of that. And I've always had a desire to keep changing and reinventing myself. That capacity for reinvention, we're going to have to let people know of any age is innate and intuitive inside you. That, you know, you, you know you're going to be growing um, all of your life. And I think maybe, the, again, to be optimistic is to see this as, an, as a chance to grow, to develop, to change and to evolve. So not to see this as something that's a threat, but actually to see it as a challenge might be uh, the next threshold for both young and old. Yeah, it's kind of like the body. If you fast, if you exercise, if you try things that push yourself, not too much, but enough, then you grow from it. But if you push too hard, you break. It will be interesting to see what happens. I know people have, people have been breaking a bit, but not societally yet. I like to call myself, Matt, a possibilitarian. I, I like to see myself as a possibility thinker rather than a poverty thinker. To see, you know, to say an optimist, you know, you see a glass half full, the pessimist sees it as it's half empty, the optimist sees it as half full, the cynic says it's twice, as, it's twice as big as it needs to be and the opportunist drinks the water. I think we have to have an opportunistic attitude to the future. We have to be possibilitarians uh, to see the possibility 
and to see it as an exciting adventure that we can actually grasp with both hands. Human beings are nothing if not versatile and adaptable. We've been adapting since Adam was a boy, Matt. So that's one thing I'm, I, I, I can place faith in, that we will continue to evolve and to be versatile and to adapt to the circumstances that we face ourselves in. And I think we, part of that is having the confidence that we can do so and also creating the right mindset, the right set of attitudes and beliefs about ourselves. You know, Henry Ford said, if you believe you can, you're right. He also said, if you believe you can't, you're also right. So what beliefs are holding us and serving us and what beliefs are holding us back? So it comes down to attitude too, Matt. Hello? Hey, there you just... <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what happened there. Matt, you said, this Irish man talks way too much. I'm out of here. Exactly, exactly. No. It uh the connection cut out. Oh, I don't know. What was the last thing you were saying? I think I said something that we, you know that I, I would believe in our capacity to adapt and to change and to take advantage of the opportunities that exist in this new world that's being created. Exactly. The glass isn't half full or half half empty. You just got to take it and drink it. Yeah, it's, exactly. um, I think that's it that everybody needs. I think it can also be. Again, I'm, I don't know what's going on. Your 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 stand. I I I seem to be. I don't know if I, is it dropping on my end or your end. I, I seem to be solid, but I don't know if it would be. I think it's my end for some reason. Um, let's see. I'll we'll try this one more time, and if it doesn't work, then I'll cool. just uh, I'll hit you on Skype. Sound good? Cool. Awesome. Google technology. It's incredible yeah. until it's not right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, Matt. Exactly. So I wanted to ask you now, in terms of where you see the world headed, what are you most excited about and what are you most worried of? Um, I'm just excited to where, where technology is bringing us and, 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 and how it's going to converge with, with, with humanity and, and, and get more integrated. I see technology becoming more immersive, more integrated. My, my, my big fear, Matt, is how we relate to other human beings, you know, that uh, the issue of loneliness, people feeling disenfranchised, people feeling disconnected. That's my great fear. How losing conversational intelligence, Matt. And I see it with young people. I, and by the way, I think sometimes we give young people a very hard time. I really believe in young people, you know, and the same people who give out about young people. If you go to a restaurant this evening, Matt, with your significant other, everyone is glued to their screens and people are losing that capacity just to talk to people. And that's what really worries me the most, the, the, the people feeling disconnected, alienated, and, we, and a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. We're hardwired to connect. The greatest friend to depression, Matt, is loneliness. And its greatest enemy is human connection. We're hardwired to connect. 
And when we don't feel that we have our tribe, um, we feel cognitive dissonance. We feel somewhere in our brains, we're under threat. We feel anxiety. And there's huge issues around mental health. And I think it stems from that, man. People not feeling they have their, their tribe, that they're connected. And I do really get concerned about that. People feeling that they matter. And of course, we all have an invisible sign, Matt, you, me, everyone listening here today. Do I matter and am I heard? And too many people feel that they don't matter. And too many people aren't being heard in our society. Too many people are being dismissed. And I think you could, you could say that's very glib, but I really think that's very important, that everybody feels part of the conversation, that everybody feels seen and that everybody feels heard. And that would be my great fear. That will be a twin track in the future, Matt, where you've got this kind of connected world and then you've got a lot of people feeling disconnected living in that world. It's a potential Fermi paradox solution. Society evolves itself to the smartphone and then can't get beyond that. It's quite extraordinary, Matt. You know, I go into the lunchroom here for, for dinner and I see people glued to their phones rather than talking to the person right beside them. And that conversation and intelligence is hugely important in the in the in the marketplace, Matt. And I, I, I you mentioned that, you know, how much is this is airy fairy. I think this is as real and relevant as ever. Um I was conversing to a, a vice president of Facebook and she I was asking her, who are the people you hire? Who are the people's CVs that the curriculum beat to the resumes that stay on your desk as opposed to the bin? Who are the people that get the, the job as opposed to the letter saying, sorry, but not today? And she said very simply and succinctly, I hire for attitude and I train for aptitude. And I think that's hugely important. Your attitude, your disposition, your mentality, your mindset. These are hugely important to take advantage of the opportunities that are going to present itself, Matt, you know? And that's where, again, I come back to that strategic optimism. I see a, a world of possibility rather than a world of fear. But the important to actually harness the opportunities is the disposition that you hold towards it. But that conversation and intelligence, that common sense, all of these are very important for young people to utilize the opportunities that will exist for them. The world is there for them, Matt. It's important that they're in a space and positioned in a space and helped by people educators and parents to take advantage of the opportunities that will present themselves to them. Ask for help when you need it. How'd you, how'd you get involved with the Make-A-Wish Foundation? Well, I, I suppose I was, I, I was, I, I say to young people, you know, there's power in reaching out, reaching in and reaching up. You know, you reach in and find out about yourself, you know, understanding yourself is power. And we spoke about reaching out. And I reached out to the CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation in Ireland. And I said, I love what you're doing. You're, 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 you're helping to create dreams for young people. What an amazing, what an amazing gift. You know, Martin Luther King, that famous civil rights leader, he didn't say, I have a strategic plan. He said, I have a dream. You know, it starts with a dream. And her dream was to help young people. And I, I thought that was a noble cause. I brought her in and we, we, we saw we were on the same page. And, and Susan O'Dwyer, Susan very kindly said, look, we'd love you on the board. Um, we think that you think a little bit different to us. And I think we, you can add a bit of value. And I've been there ever since and been an honour and a privilege. I think, um, Matt, helping people is the biggest way I know to make yourself feel good and to help your own mental well-being. And sometimes young people have a what's in it for me approach. But by volunteering, by helping other people, you raise your own levels of dopamine and oxytocin. And uh, I think it's very important to help other people, to actually reach out. And it makes me feel good if I can help young, one young person um, it gives me enormous satisfaction. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization in the States. It originated from the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and it does fantastic work, and I'm honored and proud to represent it here in Ireland. What do you think the future of experiential to big-time things like that is? So I know the Make-A-Wish Foundation is a foundation. It's funded by some type of trust, most likely. But they're they're doing really good work, and you see a lot of times, especially especially in the U.S. The government's not doing a whole heck of a lot in terms of improving things. It's much more businesses or more specifically foundations and nonprofits. What do you see as the future for these important missions for humanity and for society? If I could segue slightly, but, 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 but still in the same sphere, I sometimes ask people, is there more good in the world or bad in the world? And sometimes, depending what, if you're, if you're listening to the news, it's probably bad. And we won't even get into the states, the situation in America, uh, Matt. But if you get involved in organizations like the Make-A-Wish Foundation, 
unquestionably you would say there's so much good. To see ordinary people, Matt, and what they do in their time and in their effort and their energy will reconnect you to your humanity and to what's good in human beings. And to answer your question, the future of those foundations doesn't lie with big business. It lies with big people, ordinary people like you and me connecting and wanting to make a difference. And once they're connected to the roots, that's very important. What happens sometimes to charities, Matt, is that they disconnect from what made them great in the first place. The grassroots, the ordinary people who want to help for the sake of helping. Not big business, not big corporate responsibility or big funds. It's about ordinary people in the grassroots. And I see that with the volunteerism in the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Ordinary people, young people giving their pocket money, decent people doing decent things. That's the future of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Matt. That's the future of organisations. When you disconnect yourself from that, um, I think you kind of lose touch with your, mis- your, your raison d'etre, as the French would say your founding mission, your founding values. It comes back down to your values and it's about people. And I think that's happened with governments and corporations around the world. Is that the solution? We have to make everything smaller? Because if we do that, we also we become more close-knit, but also more separatist. We have Brexit. We build a wall in the US. We decide that we're only going to associate with people that are XYZ like us. How do you balance that if only sm- if small groups do perform so much better for a lot of the things that make us human? There's the there's that yeah. 155 number Dunbar's number. Yeah, 100 percent, Matt. And you know this group think and and surrounding yourself with people have to have your own moral view. I like to say, Matt, life is a bit like a beach ball. Imagine if we had an imaginary beach ball between you you and I, and I asked you what color you saw, and you would say unquestionably yellow. I'd say white. Of course, the answer is we're both right. And I think sometimes we get caught up in the thinking that my side of the beach ball is the only color. Um, the truth is the map is not the territory. Everybody has this, something to offer. And by asking you, can you describe your color to me? That's going to inform my view. And I would agree with you 100 percent. Diversity of friends, an eclectic worldview, different sharing opinions has never been more important. Just having one orthodoxy is not good. And the confirmation bias kicks in. I think it's very important to entertain other dispens- you know, other view- worldviews and, 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 and viewpoints. We had the same polarised opinions in Ireland. To our, our, our harm over years with North and South, you know, Protestant, Catholic, you know, nationalist, unionist. And we've seen the harm that that's done. And I, my great fear in, in your country, Matt, is it, it seems to have gone down the same pathway in many cases. And that doesn't serve anybody, you know. And we, coming out of that, we're in recovery. And um, but to come back to your central premise, I think it's very important that we entertain the legitimacy of different views other than our own. And to, I suppose also to have a, an attitude of gratitude, you know, to be grateful to, for what we have, to increase empathy, to allow people to have a different world view. I think we see too much adversarial thinking in politics and in social commentary and indeed political commentary. I'm right, you're wrong. Rather than entertaining, maybe we both have a certain version of the truth. No one has ownership of the truth, Matt. And I think when somebody, you know, Oscar Wilde said, I'm no longer oh, I'm no longer young enough to think I know it all. Nobody knows it all, Matt. And uh, I don't like to sit around anybody who, who has, you know, simplistic answers to complicated reality, I straight away skeptical of. Should, uh, let's play devil's advocate. Should we make more aggressive polarization something that could, possibly save the save the solution so to speak should debate be something that's mandatory in all schools because it does force you to take both sides of an argument i think so i well i think what you're alluding to matt is critical thinkers i mean if we're not creating creative critical thinkers independent thinkers empowering student voice what are we doing you know that's what education is all about is actually to empower a young person's own incredible intuitive individual voice that's what you're asking. And I think to debate even amongst ourselves, to question our own beliefs. I'd ask my students this morning to hold their beliefs up to the light and see which one of their beliefs and attitudes are serving them and which ones are holding them back. Um, I remember when I um, got the results for my college scores, uh, I was the first person in my family, Matt, of either side to go to college. And I couldn't wait for my father, who was a labouring man. He was a stonemason by trade, left school early, like many of his generation, and I couldn't wait till he came home to show my results. And I will remember it so vividly, Matt. He opened the door. He was like myself, small man, big belly, broad smile. 
And I said, Dad, I'm after getting the points for college. And I saw a momentary flicker of pride, Matt. And um, and then the only way I could describe it was like the portcullis or the drawbridge came up and he changed. And he said a sentence I'll never forget. He said, son, people like us don't go places like that. That was my father's belief, Matt. You see, we didn't have any money. My father was a rock thinker, uh, but I was very lucky. I had a mum who was a water thinker. You see, my mum was a possibilitarian, like money, many mums are. My mum was a water thinker. You see, water always finds a level and it finds its way. And my mum said, we'll find a way. But my father's belief wasn't serving him or me. He wasn't trying to crush my dreams, but he just did not see a way. And sometimes a young person will say, I'm never going to get a relationship. I'm never going to have that job. Sometimes we have to question our thinking and something and our patterns of thought, our beliefs and see, actually, is this helping me or is this hindering me? So to come back to your point, Matt, I think it's very important that we we create a generation of young, independent, thinking, sentient human beings who are not just taking as gospel what they read on their social media timeline, but actually question, question things, question people, bring in that intuitive curiosity. It's never been more needed. We need a young generation prepared to question the old orthodoxies, the old established ways of doing things. It's no harm to question, Matt, and to find, it's the only way to find answers that I know. It was at Einstein who said, you won't find solutions on the same premise that you asked the question. So keep asking questions. Yeah, and it's incredibly important, especially as we have better longevity technology. We don't want the old farts living longer and not questioning <laughs> them. So I- well, sir with the old mentality definitely not bad. no so i have a question i'm firmly of the belief that most people and it's controversial to say but i think most people are too weak to change themselves they're not willing to do the hard things because we're not evolved to do the hard things we're evolved to get by and survive through thick and thin more or less by putting on weight avoiding fear avoiding heights we're, we try to avoid the scary stuff because that's the yeah. stuff that could kill us how do we systematically make people question some of these beliefs is it something mandatory in, in school is it regulations that we need to have on websites and and uh, social media channels for instance here's a video oh, by the way this is 97 percent of wikipedia says that this is false how, how do you do that and force it into people's consciousness because i don't think they're going to do it willingly because it's much easier for us to agree on something because once we've agreed and it's over with well great now i can move on to the next thing it doesn't take up my time or energy how do we force that that's a great question i suppose what you're talking about is the way the brain is set up we're we're, we're, we're programmed for the easy road you know in a way we're programmed to avoid pain it's a shortcut avoid... yeah and so i suppose maybe it starts with actually helping people understand how we sometimes get in our own way i mean the negativity bias for example uh, and that actually sometimes the easy way is not the best way that and also also to point out the benefits sometimes of a bit of hard work, you know, to change, you know, and also to point out, Matt, that an old dog can learn new tricks. A lot of people think, look, at, I am who I am. This is the way I am. That fixed mindset, you know, that actually, so actually, that's not the way it is. We have that capacity to change and look at the benefits of changing for your own life, for the life of other people. So I think it's it's it's. Educating, again, Matt, comes back to education of young people and to older people of what they actually have the capacity to do, not to limit themselves in that old view thinking of, look, at, I'm all right, Jack. It's it served me well up to now. That mode of thinking is not going to take advantage of the, of the opportunities, Matt, that exist going forward. That's the danger for that for somebody who sits in, in that situation. And look, at, life is not a, it's not a candy floss bounce on a, on a, on a, on a marshmallow trampoline. Life is difficult, Matt. You know, life is hard, but you can bounce back one more time than you fall. And that's what I teach. That's resilience for young people. And I think, you know, what we've done as a generation, a very affluent generation, Matt, the, the most affluent generation of people has ever lived on planet Earth with the longest life expectancy. That's a fact. That can't be on the question. There's a, there's a concept here we call snowplow parenting, where parents, for the best of intentions, have kind of taken away the natural problems in front of their children but it's been at the expense of their own resilience. You know, there's nothing more creative than a young person stuck, you know? And um, so it's very important that we tap young people into the fact that fail, fail is first attempt in learning, that mistakes are vile, very interesting learning experiences. 
So what I try to do to young people and to older people is say, look, that inner critic that sits in your shoulders keeps on telling you that you can't, you, you can't do it. There's no point. What's the point anyway? I'm, I'm, I'm done. Listen to your inner, cro- your inner coach when you make a mistake or fail and say to yourself, what's one thing I can learn that can change my behavior going forward? And if you listen to that, tune in that channel, Matt, the chances of a better outcome go up exponentially. And if you can put a if you can put a pause between a thought and an action. So I had a grandma and she's she's died now, but she was she was a crazy old fiery lady. She was the she was one of the most powerful people you'll ever meet. But as she got older, she got a little bit more mellow. Before that, it would be someone shows up late to Christmas. Oh, they finally made it. Or she's walking and sees someone who's a little overweight. Look at the ass on that one. But over time, what happened is she learned to say, shut up, Ruth, and then to either say or not say the thing. And I think that pause between the thoughts and the actions can be very valuable because the thoughts that we all have are just drifting in our head. There's nothing actually there. And generally speaking, it has no meaning. I might be thinking right now I have an elephant on my foot and I don't have an elephant on my foot. It would be pretty cool, but it's just a thought. And that ability to to separate from that is, is something valuable, I think, that you brought up. Absolutely massive. Can I say, can I speak to that in two, two parts, Matt? The first one, can I just say that, you know, if people take nothing away from this conversation between ourselves today, thoughts aren't facts and feelings aren't facts. That's the, the first thing. And the second thing is, can I give you a gift? Um, and I learned this from a woman in Ireland who's one of my heroes, Sister Stan, who spent her life helping the poor and disenfranchised. She would be the equivalent of Nelson Mandela in the eyes of many Irish people. And I had a conversation with her and I came away and I had a kind of an epiphany around what you're talking about, putting that pause between saying something and not. And I call it my triple filter test. And it might save a relationship for you, Matt, one day or for me. It certainly has saved me putting my foot in my mouth on more than occasions than I already do. And the triple filter test is this. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? And does this need to be said by me, by me now? So I run that through my, if I've got something, maybe it's a piece of gossip in, 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 that I've just heard. Does this need to be said? Mm, not really. It's just a bit of gossip. I don't even know if it's, if it's true or not. Does this need to be said by me? Well, maybe I'm not the person who should say it. It should be somebody yeah. else. And does this need to be said by me now? Maybe it does need to be said. Maybe I'm the person to say it. But this is not the appropriate forum for it. That's my triple filter test, Matt. And I completely agree with you. Sometimes our problems is our mouth runs away with us. And I sometimes think of the word wait in my head when I'm about to jump in. Why am I talking? And so if you combine wait with the triple filter test, it might save you making a a, a huge error someday. We could probably solve social media as well. You just have an extra thing you have to click after you hit submit. <laughs> Are you sure you want to submit? I know, Um, what was it? Lincoln used to write letters of more or less ripping people apart, his generals and such, and give them to his wife to send. And she would just put them in the waste bin or do whatever. Because once you'd gotten it out there, that was all you really needed. That's right. And can I say, Matt, and you, you know your, your, your history far better than I do. Am I right in saying that Abe Lincoln, one of your great presidents, also surrounded himself with people who had views contrary to his own by design. He, it was, was a strategy that members of his cabinet would be not fans or advocates of his opinion, but he deliberately sought out opinions contrary to his. I think that showed great wisdom. And I suppose we've never needed more wisdom today, Matt, on both sides of our pond. You know, in a world that seems very fractious and very disjointed and very aggressive, I think we need more of that wisdom of Abe Lincoln, of consciously having the self-confidence to surround himself with people who have views contrary to his and having the confidence that my my views can stand up to the scrutiny of another person's argument i think it's really important i think that's super important as well that's part of the purpose of the podcast is we get essentially ted talks are incredible you get some of the smartest people in the world but you get them for 10 minutes on a canned little pitch that they've done a million times before you don't really get into the nitty gritty details and everyone's got interesting perspectives to share. I think so. It's only a soundbite, Matt, really. And there's a whole story behind it. And I think that's what you're doing when you're doing a great service to people is to kind of say, look, if this is a topic of interest to you, let's dive a bit deeper. And I think that's something that's to be welcome and you're to be commended for allowing the platform to do so. 
Yeah, and it's going well. People seem to be enjoying it. Hopefully, we're enjoying this episode, guys. I got one last question for you, John, before we start to wrap things up. And that's if you had to leave people with one piece of advice. It can be a quote, a call to action, anything. Before we get a little bit more into you and your background and where people can find you, what would it be and why? Can I can I cheat and give you two? You can cheat. Um, well, the first one is that I really believe that happiness is an inside job. I really believe that. But the 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 the, the, word, the lesson I suppose the, the sentence that I'd like to leave you with was taught to me when I was ten by a teacher, uh, Miss Holmes, and she said, "I want you to write down a sentence in your copy that has some kind of significance, but it can only have ten words." And each word can only have two letters. And we were befuddled, didn't know what to write. And she wrote down a sentence on the board that I'd like to leave your listeners with because it changed my life, literally. If it is to be, it is up to me. And in that moment, she transformed a young gaggle of young people to realize that we could change obstacles and opportunities. So if it is to be, Matt, it is up to me. It starts with being responsible, responsible, that the best place to find a helping hand is at the end of your own arm. That to me is resilience. And that was taught to me by a great teacher. And I honor her memory by mentioning her here in your ghost company today. That's probably why you became a teacher. I mean, I imagine it's a big part of it. Well, we all need that one good adult, Matt. We all need that champion in our lives. Never more so now. Young people need that one good adult, that oasis in your desert. And we all remember, I, I say, and I t- talk to educators all over Ireland, Matt. The good news is you make the difference. The bad news is you make the difference. You know, in 50 years time, they'll be talking about you. Now, it's up to you whether that conversation is positive or negative, because those words have living roots. Um, and I, I, saw, I learned something, Matt, and I didn't say in the TED Talk. And again, I'll just give you a gift to share with your listeners, which I think is absolutely mind blowing uh, about networking. And uh, somebody uh, linked into my TED Talk and said, can I do you know the he was a magician? He said, um, do you know the provenance of the word when you were younger, Matt, and you did a magic trick? What word would you use to accompany the trick? Abracadabra, alakazam, hocus pocus. Abracadabra. Do you know the provenance of that word? No. The provenance, he he went and he was a kind of a linguist. Andrew Bennett is his name. And Andrew went to Stanford MIT. And he found out that the word abracadabra is an ancient Aramaic word that predates the time of Jesus. And it translates roughly into what I speak is what I create. What I speak. Oh, God, you're off again. Can you, you cut that? out again? Yeah, yeah. I'll so, splice it together. Yeah, the, the, it, it, tra- it, it, it transpires that the word abracadabra, when you, you translate it, is what I speak is what I create. And that was very powerful. So words create worlds. So I sometimes say to a young person, what, 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 what's going on in your head? What are you saying to yourself? Because you're actually creating your world, you know, in the words that you speak. So to speak positively to yourself, to connect your inner coach. But that is, I thought was very powerful, that your words are creating your world. What I speak is what I create, abracadabra. You know, I thought it was very, very, uh, a very powerful message for people. So you can, be, you can be your own magic. You can be your own magic. And people that consider themselves lucky are more likely to find money, 100%. more likely to find opportunities, more likely to find everything because they're looking for it. They're absolutely mad. You know, Einstein said you can wake up and choose to see every day is a miracle or like no day is a miracle. And I think that's really true. You're making your miracles with your attention. Where are you putting your attention? And I say that the things you have in your life to be grateful for are all sitting silently at the back of your awareness. And if even for once a day, Matt, you bring that to your consciousness, what am I grateful for? Because we've got so much to be grateful for. I'm having the privilege of sharing with you today. Yeah. It's a sunny day outside. I've got the privilege. I, I, it's I, sunny I, in Ireland, guys. That's it, a big deal. And yes, you did hear that correctly. Um, it does shine. So, I mean, there's a lot to be grateful for, Matt. And I think bringing your attention to, I, I call it kind of, you know, a mindset, you know, take it away from that lack mindset to a kind of a more a grateful mindset can be one of the single biggest thing you can do to increase your happiness quotient and to lower the threshold, you know, lower the threshold of what you're grateful for increases your happiness quotient. If your life sucks, it doesn't matter how much money is in the bank. Thanks for coming on today, John. Thank you. A pleasure, Matt. I'm very grateful to you. Where do people find you? What's the best place to connect? Well, you'll find me on Twitter at A Way to Wellbeing, Instagram, A Way to Wellbeing. I'd be happy with any comments on email, ways to wellbeing at yahoo.com. And you can find my TED Talk, John Dorn and TED Talk. You should find me there. And you might be very kind to post the link to the TED Talk on your platform, Matt. 
Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Hopefully this has been fun. It's a little outside the conventional box for what we do, but if we're creating scientists, entrepreneurs, inventors that are changing the world and hating their lives doing it, or they're robotic like Zuckerberg and destroying the world on accident, I think that's uh, that's problematic. So we might as well try to solve some of these issues now. So the we get one life, we get one go round. So it might as well not suck and kind of be awesome. Right? Matt, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. See you guys.